Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you um, to, the, to the philosophy of science group in India for inviting me to give this talk and to Tarun Manan for arranging it. Um, what I want to do today is talk to you about trust in scientific evidence. So um, I'm from Michigan State University. My name is Heather Douglas. Um, and this is the rough outline of the talk. First, I want to talk about the state of trust in science. Then I want to talk about, we'll talk about grounding trust in science, the nature of expertise and how expertise is essential for the assessments of scientific evidence, the nature of the scientific com community and the expert community and how much that is important to grounding trust. In addition, the scientific experts values, I will argue, is super important to the grounding of trust. And then I will draw general conclusions. So first, the state of trust in science. What is the state of trust in science? The good news is that generally, uh, when people do surveys, for example, this is a survey of Americans done in January 2019. So before the COVID-19 pandemic hit a year before, trust has gone up. Um, scientists are now trusted more than the military, than uh, school principals, clearly more than politicians or elected officials, more than business leaders, more than the news media. So scientists are among the most trusted groups in America. Uh, this has actually been a fairly stable trend. So if you survey Americans, this is going data going back from 1973 to 2016, where the previous data takes over, um, there's pretty stable trust in at least the community leaders of the uh, scientific community. And this is not just an American phenomenon. Um, uh, in fact, you know, recent data from Hanel, Hanel, Hanel and Mao asking people about trust in science, the world over found that most you know, every country, the population is actually above the median, that most people trust science the world over. So there's a sense that there's, however, a crisis. And I think there are a number of causes for this crisis. Um, certainly things like the March for Science and the rise of alternative facts, um, the replication crisis, worries about uh, the reliability of uh, pharmaceutical research, or research in agricultural sciences, particular locations of science. In addition, as you see in the um, upper left corner, that's the upper left corner for you, um, there are uh, divergences between different political groups in how they trust science. So again, this is US data and the red line are conservatives in the US and you can see their trust declining dramatically over the period from the mid 70s to 2010 or worries about the state of trust of vaccinations, particularly for the pandemic crisis. Um, you know, it's lower than uh, you know, the feelings of distrust um, in the safety of vaccines is at least below 33% everywhere. These are the top countries of distrust. But the fact that there is such a substantial portion that distrust vaccines worries public health officials greatly. Now, the COVID-19 crisis has shifted this somewhat. Um, it looks like, uh, at least this is data from the UK, that um, people are beginning to trust experts who are speaking to them about the crisis, that scientific expertise has come to the fore more. But there are still these undercurrents that people worry a great deal about. And that's um, why we have to think more carefully about what grounds trust in science and scientific evidence. So what does, should ground trust in science? This, the start, we should start with the question of why should we trust science? Because science is not always right. Um, there are plenty of cases in the history of science, even in the history of recent science, where scientists have been very wrong about things. For example, diethylstilbestrol in the 1940s and 50s, when scientists thought it was a good way to control morning sickness. In fact, it caused birth defects. Um, a lot of experts in the 1970s argued that nuclear reactor meltdowns weren't possible in water reactors and didn't really believe that the Three Mile Island reactor 
in the US had had a meltdown until robotic cameras got inside the uh, reactor and showed that in fact, there had been meltage of the um, reactor. Or if you look at the case of the causation of stomach ulcers and the difficulty of getting scientists to grapple with evidence that there was a bacterial cause and it wasn't just stress and diet. Or if you take a current case, uh, we keep hearing about the technical feasibility of fusion energy. And for my entire lifetime, it's been 20 years out um, and I'm over 50. So this is not great for uh, the sort of projections of scientists. However, even when science is not fully accurate and scientists get stuff wrong, it can still be importantly informative for our reasoning. And science also sometimes tells us things we don't want to hear or news that is unwelcome. For example, there is a pandemic coming. So it's really important to actually have sort of a sense of what it is that we're after when we have argue for trust in science. So what does it mean to trust science? I think that it should mean we should listen to science and scientists in particular, scientific experts, to help us make decisions. But we don't just want reliance on science. We don't just want it to be like a mechanical process. I think we want that thicker trust relationship that Annette Beyer began uh, the work sort of I'm drawing from here. Um, this entails a belief that the trusted party will act on our behalf with our interests in mind. Reliance might be, I might be relying upon the internet, um, for example, or my computer to record this talk properly and to get it to you to share properly, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I trust the internet. Um, believing a trust relationship is more than just reliance. It involves this um, thicker sense of the processes will be acting on our behalf or the person will be acting on our behalf. So this means in part that scientists should be pursuing projects that are in the public interest, not against it. And we've seen controversies about this come up in terms of facial recognition software, who gets to use it for what purposes, the use of artificial intelligence, the use of policing algorithms. There are concerns about whether or not particular projects that scientists might be pursuing in these cases in computer science that might actually be against the public interest. So I think it's helpful to think of trust in science as something that entails a prima facie yet defeasible sense of the epistemic worth of science, its general reliability, at least that it's the best available epistemic understanding that we have at any given time, even if it might prove wrong, and that it is done in the public interest. So how do we ground this kind of trust in science? What serves as a basis? Because we don't wanna just say, trust us without sort of any basis. We don't wanna you know, have blind trust. Um, but there's a real deep epistemic gap, a problem in grounding the sort of trust because the non-expert cannot fully assess the expert and their expertise, that's part of what it means to be a non-expert is you are not inside the epistemic discourse that the expert is part of. And the non-expert also cannot fully assess the scientific data. So if you just put all your data on the internet, which doesn't work when you have privacy issues for human subjects, but you put all the data on the internet and let people look at it, very often it's just reams of numbers. It doesn't actually help people assess it. Or even if it's qualitative data, it's just mountains of words. In addition, past success of science generally cannot ground trust in science. And this is partly because the success was not uniform. There are failures, um, failures across ranges of disciplines. Um, and so one might wonder whether or not the situation one's in now involves scientific failure or success. And then there's the problem that present science and expertise is usually very often not the same as past science and expertise. And so one has is relying on say on different experts talking about different evidence for different issues. So past success by itself doesn't ground trust. So we can't have um, a full expert to expert assessment that might ground trust. And we can't uh, just say past track record. So what should ground it? Um, first, I think it's important to realize that 
uh, trust in scientific evidence is um, really based on trust in scientific expertise. That expertise is required for the scientific uh, data gathering process. Ooh, required, required, whoops. Um, expertise is needed for the framing of questions, the proper use of methodology, the proper use of equipment, um, curation of data, and the interpretation of the evidence. Now, I'm not saying that only traditionally trained experts can do proper, good scientific data collection. Um, very often, citizen scientists are able to um, ask questions and pursue methodologies that produce just as reliable knowledge, either with or without the initial help of traditionally trained scientific experts. So this is not something that only traditionally trained scientific experts should be trusted to do, as I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but some expertise is needed. And when sci citizen scientists or community groups doing science develop their own um, pursuit of scientific knowledge, they often develop a great deal of expertise about the kind of evidence that they want to collect. So we really are talking about trust in scientific expertise when we talk about trust in science. So here are some uh, answers that have been given to what uh, might ground trust in science. Some have emphasized institutional markers, uh, such as uh, have you earned a PhD from a reputable university? Um, uh, do you have publications in the right kind of places? Um, have you received awards for your work? Um, I'm going to raise some concerns about those uh, being the ground of trust in science, um, although I'll argue they're important in some sense. Um, some authors like Elizabeth Anderson here have argued that scientific consensus is a main way to ground trust. Um, she writes before a consensus, um, the best course for the layperson is to suspend judgment. Once a consensus of trustworthy experts is consolidated, laypersons are well advised to accept the consensus. And other uh, folks have suggested that scientific method is in fact the thing to emphasize. I'm going to suggest here that these are inadequate answers. Um, uh, institutional markers, I think, are neither necessary nor sufficient for trustworthy expertise. Um, there are people who don't have the traditional background and training, um, don't have a PhD, who prove to be incredibly reliable experts. Um, and there are people who are traditionally trained who prove to be not tr uh, very trustworthy or reliable experts. Scientific consensus is helpful. I will show exactly how, but it can still be untrustworthy because, for example, in the case of diethylstilbestrol, it was a consensus among many scientists uh, that it was a useful um, and safe drug to take. Um, that consensus began to be eroded by the mid to late 1950s, but it took a fair amount of effort to really um, push scientists away from that. Or if you think about the consensus around uh, ulcer formation, very strong consensus, not properly formed. Um, so there are all kinds of things that can impede the proper formation of consensus. Um, I think it's also a practical mistake to emphasize the need for consensus for two reasons. The first being that the public cannot wait for consensus in many cases. Scientific consensus can be slow to form and we don't want to say, just suspend judgment, you know, don't act until consensus is formed. In addition, if you argue that you shouldn't trust until consensus forms, it incentivizes interested actors to forestall the formation of consensus. So do what they can to keep consensus from forming. Um, so I think that consensus, while helpful, and I'll explain later in the talk exactly how it's helpful, is not uh, the mark of trust in science. And for the concerns about scientific method, I recommend looking at Naomi Resky's book, Why Trust Science, for why this is not an adequate um, approach. So an alternative approach that I will be laying out today is that we should do three things. First, you have to detect the presence of expertise. And I'll talk about how one does that without being an expert. Um, second, to assess the functioning of the expert's epistemic community. 
and I'll talk about how that should be done and what kind of markers for good functioning one should look for. And the third is to assess the values of the expert. So this approach allows one to assess individual experts for trustworthiness without requiring the same expertise of the assessor and without waiting for consensus. Okay. So how do we assess the presence of expertise and what is this thing expertise? I think we should think of expertise as a fluency of judgment in a particular domain. So this doesn't mean that the expert is always right or has all the answers or knows the truth, but they understand what the key aspects and issues are in a domain and are thus able to ask the crucial questions to understand what kinds of methodologies are reliable or not, what the kinds of problems might be with methodologies. It's this kind of fluency of judgment that um, makes expertise expertise. And I think we are each experts in some domains and non-experts in many, many others. I know this doesn't look like a spectrum, it looks like a dichotomy, but imagine that this is a spectrum. Um, PowerPoint is kind of hard to make this clear on. So there's different kinds of expertise. Some expertise is very what you might call success accessible. So success is clear and it's short term and you can see whether or not success exists. Uh, for example, chess players. We know who the best chess players in the world are because they win the chess games against the other best chess players of the world. Or we know who the best Go players are because they win the games. We also might know who the expert car mechanics are because they fix our cars successfully and the car runs for a fair amount of time afterwards. We know who the best athletes are because they have success in competition. Um, Aristotle mentioned that, you know, we know who the good cooks are because the meal is great, even if we couldn't possibly replicate it ourselves. And John Dewey talks about shoemakers, that we know a good shoemaker because frankly, we wear the shoe and it feels good. Then there are experts where success is not so easy to assess. And it is these kinds of experts that are the ones that are really contested in our public discourse. So we think about climate modelers. Um, you know, eventually we'll know uh, whether or not the projections made by climate models are, climate modelers are reliable. But by that time, uh, we will not have, we'll have missed the window for action. Um, same thing for epidemiologists attempting to assess long-term health impacts. Um, very often there are so many confounders in real populations that uh, you know, even if epidemiologists make a recommendation, whether or not it was their recommendation that improved public health outcomes can be hard or difficult to assess. And so success is not quite so easy to assess toxicologists, field biologists, molecular, molecular biologists. And we might think about epidemiologists as um, doing with pandemic research as being in the middle, sort of in between these two. So there's plenty of experts that are neither super success accessible, easy to assess in terms of, su of success, nor really difficult. They might be sort of mid-range. And if you think about your relationship to your physician, um, you know, you, you do want to follow the advice of your expert physician. Sometimes whether or not their advice is working or not can be hard to assess in the medium term, but you get some sense of whether or not, say, issues are being resolved over periods of months. That's the same kind of um, possibility of assessment that we have now for epidemiologists in the midst of a pandemic. You know, do does following their advice successfully flatten the curve? Are we reducing transmission rates? Um, and so there we do have kind of a mid range. It takes a couple of months and we might have forgotten what they actually projected by the time we get to the assessment, but there is a possibility for success assessment in the medium term. And that's why there's a spectrum. Expertise kinds of smears up along this sort of range. Now, just to go back, 
for experts who are easy to assess success, we can just select experts who are successful. That's really straightforward. In the medium term, we might be willing to wait for success, but we also might need to make decisions about what to do before even we allow the months to go by to allow us for medium term assessment. And then for the long term cases, we really can't wait for all the data to come in for us to figure out whether or not their projections were right and whether or not we can actually separate them for the, from the other confounders that might be going on. So what should we expect from this kind of expertise if we can't use success as the key measure of the presence of expertise? And here I wanna draw from the work of Julia Ennis, who wrote about moral expertise, that expertise requires that the expert, unlike the mere muddler or the person with the unintellectual knack, be able to give an account of what it is that she is expert in. The expert, but not the dabbler, can explain why she's doing what she's doing instead of being stuck with inarticulacy or being reduced to saying that it feels right this way. She can explain why this is, here and now, the appropriate thing to do in these circumstances. And if we think about, again, the spectrum of success, it is this kind of explanation that we desperately need in the cases where we can't just use success as the um, measure of expertise. So when epidemiologists and scientists began to explain to us what we need to do to flatten the curve, we needed the explanations of what it was that was going on and why their recommendations would plausibly work. Even more so with climate modeling, epidemiology for long-term impacts and other long-term projection or complex system assessments. We don't need those kinds of assessments from chess players. Many chess players cannot explain how they won a game. Just the fact that they did is enough. Or a car mechanic may not be able to explain what their process was exactly. And the explanation of what was wrong might be rather thin, but that's okay because the car works. Once you get to areas of expertise where success is not so clear, the explanations, the explications of what is happening, of how one forms a judgment become crucial. So, for experts whose success in the short term is readily accessible, measures of success suffice. These are not the experts we have debates about whether or not their expertise is trustworthy. For experts whose success in the short term is not readily accessible, they must be able to explicate or explain their judgments. And it's these experts who offer at the, often at the center of trust debates. Explaining judgment, I want to make clear, does not transmit the bulk of expertise or make one who hears the expert's explanation an expert. Demanding and receiving explanations doesn't turn the non-expert into an expert. Instead, and you can imagine, if you think about any time you've received such an explanation yourself, it does um, show the complexity with which the expert is grappling. Whenever I ask an expert to explain how they came to a judgment, I very often find that there are issues and factors I had never heard of, much less thought of, that have gone into the judgment. Um, nor is it a full accounting of everything the expert is thinking, but it is sort of the main line of reasoning that they are pursuing. It's for these reasons, I think, that explications show why expertise is essential to trust in scientific evidence. Because once we start hearing these explications and these explanations of judgment, we realize how complex the territory is and why we need expertise in that territory. So that's one, that's detecting the presence of expertise, which I think can be done without becoming an expert oneself. Um, the second, thing to do is to assess the expert community that one's expert that uh, is interacting with. So this is where these institutional markers might actually be really helpful. So is the expert trained? Where, how, by whom? Degrees might be important. They might not be. Maybe it was an apprenticeship relationship. Um, more important than particular background training is perhaps, because someone might be self-trained, 
Um, are they participating in an expert community? Are they interacting with peers in the field? Certainly chess experts and Go experts are doing this. That's the people that they're playing against. Um, but even for, especially for the um, experts that we need to demand explanations of, we want to know that they are engaged in debates with their expert community, which we can tell by publications in peer reviewed journals, conference participation, um, prizes, grants. These are markers that there is engagement between an expert and a broader expert community. So um, I think and it's important to realize that present interaction with an expert community is more important in these kinds of things than past training. So people might uh, begin to eschew their past training or might not have had the kind of training that um, someone else might have, but might actually have become uh, one of the central experts in the field. Um, and then we should look as well on how that expert community is functioning. Um, so Helen Longino, who I have an image, image of here, has really emphasized this in her work on social epistemology in science. Um, are there forms for exchanging ideas that are well known? Are different experts responding to criticism? This is crucial. Um, is there tempered intellectual equality? So are people allowed to join into the expert conversation and regardless of their ethnicity or um, gender or age are taken seriously? Um, even if maybe someone who has more experience, you sort of weight their expertise slightly higher, but there should be a rough intellectual equality within the expert community. There need to be shared standards for, of course, for this debate to be ongoing, and those shared standards need to be part of um, what gets debated occasionally. You want diversity in that community to ensure that various kinds of approaches and background assumptions get unearthed and a range of views to be considered. This, I think, is what um, Elizabeth Anderson is also talking about in displaying dialogic rationality, but that's more about sort of responding to criticism and uh, perhaps, you know, including uptake of criticism. Now, this issue of criticism is crucial um, because, you know, <laughs> the quip is all professions are conspiracies against the laity. We don't want the experts to be viewed as a group that um, just kind of has its own cabal of protecting its own expertise. So one crucial issue is how does the expert community respond to criticism, including being open to outside criticism. So it's really important when criticism is raised of particular work that's done within an expert community or um, uh, of a body of knowledge that comes from outside that the fellow experts not just leap to the expert's defense who's being criticized, um, because sometimes you know experts get things wrong. Sometimes there is misbehavior of experts. For example, in the L'Aquila 2009 flawed earthquake risk assessment, um, there were risk assessors who did not do their job properly. They allowed a public official to say something that was patently false, which was that uh, tremors released energy and reduced the risk of earthquake. It was known that was not true in the region. People who heard that statement changed their patterns of behavior, died, died as a result, and the experts didn't correct the public official statement when they were brought in specifically to advise them. Now, the rest of the scientific community, so, um, when those risk assessors were charged with negligence of duty and the manslaughter that result resulted from them, with you know saying this was like a Galileo, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of inquisition, and we shouldn't allow this to happen, and you can't predict earthquakes. But that wasn't what the problem was with the experts' behavior, um, and the sort of brouhaha uh, in the international sphere. Um, really just showed a terrible tendency of experts to do this sort of protect our own first. That cannot be the behavior of experts in the face of criticism that comes from outside the expert community. Now, not every expert needs to respond to every criticism. So this can be done in a communal way. And I recommend looking at websites like realclimate.org 
where criticisms are taken seriously that of climate science, um, but not every expert has to respond to every criticism, but every criticism needs some response so that there's a continual sense of taking seriously criticism, responding to it, perhaps even changing what one is doing in the face of it. So in sum, on the expert community, the expertise uh, requires a peer community, whether it's easy to assess in terms of su success or not. So having a, an expert peer community in some sense hones one's expertise. The public does need to know whether an expert community is functioning well as an epistemic community. Is there appropriate diversity in the community? Are there fora for discussions and critiques? Is there uptake of criticism from within and from outside? Um, and it's these sorts of markers that one can actually find regarding any expert community. So expert communities should be sure to display some of their communal epistemic functioning, including the presence of debate and the presence of response to criticism. So this means that the public can assess community functioning and criticize it, for example, for not having sufficient diversity, which is a criticism that has been raised of, say, computer science. Um, without having the same expertise. Okay, so that's crucial uh, for any grounding of trust. Um, the final aspect of area to ground trust, I will argue, is the particular scientific expert's values. And the reason we have to assess a particular scientific expert's values is because we can't wait for consensus in many cases, nor do we want to valorize um, or to make uh, trusting in science depend upon the achievement of consensus for reasons I discussed earlier. So that means sometimes we have to select which experts to trust. So, oh, I have a recap here. We can assess the presence of expertise without being experts. The experts must be engaged with a well-functioning expert community. But we also want to, if we have disagreements among experts, we need experts to show commitment to important values. One of those values is the value of inquiry itself. And the second is shared social and ethical values with the public. So let me talk about each of these in turn, the two values, valuing inquiry and shared social and ethical values. Value inquiry means having the proper regard for evidence. So no fraud, no cherry picking. People are actually responsive to evidential concerns and empirical issues. And this also means properly responding to criticism. So experts should change their mind when new evidence is presented that challenges their views or be able to explain why the new evidence does not change their mind, perhaps because they're seriously worried about some methodological flaw. In addition, experts should also be able to say what evidence would change their mind. So it can't be some insurmountable bar and uh, expert, scientific experts should never say things like no evidence will change my mind because then they have left the realm of scientific empirical inquiry. So this is displayed by dialogical responsiveness and rationality. And uh, you might think of having in valuing inquiry as, in a sense, having scientific integrity. So how do you detect a lack of integrity? Um, I have uh, written about this kind of case in Bullshit and Philosophy, which is a super fun examination of um, how things go horribly wrong in some cases. Uh, an expert who lacks this valuing of inquiry, who lacks scientific integrity, will ignore inconvenient evidence when it suits them, uh, cherry pick evidence, depend upon known flawed evidence, not be able to imagine evidence that will change their mind and not respond to criticism. So lack of integrity is discovered in a pattern of argumentation and it can be detected without having to be an expert in the field itself just by watching the expert engage with other experts. In addition to this valuing of inquiry, it's also super important that the experts that we choose to trust have um, 
the same social ethical values that we do. And this is because there are at least two crucial places for values in science. Um, I say at least because there are actually several more, uh, but I'm just going to rely for the sake of argument on these two. Values direct the efforts of scientists. So they ask, they help direct the attention of scientists to particular questions and uh, to particular hypotheses. And so we might be concerned, are experts asking the right questions uh, that we think are central to the issues that the experts should be addressing? Are the right range of hypotheses being considered? In addition, values to help decide what counts as sufficient evidence. So when is the evidence that has been gathered for a hypothesis or a theory enough, strong enough? Um, epistemic values are useful in assessing the strength of the evidence, but don't address what counts as sufficient evidence. So this rests on the issue of how much uncertainty we are willing to accept in a particular context for a particular claim, and which errors are more important to us, making a claim prematurely a false positive, or failing to make a claim in sufficient time, a false negative. This is where social and ethical values play an absolutely crucial role in scientific expert judgment. So we can think about um, values in the research agenda in more depth. Um, you know, there are ca cases where we might have real worries about the social and ethical values that direct our attention and frame research questions. So we might worry about say commercial interests, directing scientists' attention to patentable outcomes. Um, we might worry about scientists looking at using methodologies that allow them to actually ignore what is a serious issue. For example, doing toxicological studies with a particular time frame that is short enough to um, not have various kinds of toxic effects that the public would be concerned about arise. So, um, you know, Jim Brown has argued that patentable pharmaceutical treatment um, is, gets an emphasis of attention, but, you know, non-patentable dietary or exercise change might actually be more effective for human health in some cases, for changes in human health. Um, Maya Goldenberg has argued that um, scientists are not so great at tracking and studying the causes of rare adverse uh, reactions to vaccines. And so um, this creates a condition of vaccine hesitancy, which is a little different than vaccine denialism. And then there are the sort of worries that Jacob Stegenga has raised about um, the ability of our medical research system to properly study the side effects of medical interventions. So interaction with and sometimes collaboration with relevant publics can help shape research agendas to be sure that the questions being asked are ones that the public views as central, as well as being informed by the expertise of scientists to um, pursue you know, uh, work that, is, that can be done. Not every question that the public wishes could be answered can be answered by the available methodologies of the time. And then there's an issue of values and evidential sufficiency. So whenever we have uh, some evidence for a scientific claim, we have to address the question, how much evidence is enough? We need some evidence, but um, the question of evidential sufficiency is answered differently by different scientists and different publics on different issues at different times. So, at different at particular points of time, we might have a range of expert opinion on particular claims. So different scientists assess evidential sufficiency di differently. Currently, there are no scientists that I know of that don't think smoking is dangerous, but in the 1950s, it was still an open question and different scientists at different times found the evidence sufficient. Or you take acid rain in the 1970s or climate change in the 1980s or the threat of neonicotinoid um, uh, uh, pesticides to pollinators in the past decade. There's always this question of, is the evidence we have currently sufficient to support a claim that might, you know, actually change policy or that people should take seriously in making their decisions about what to do. So what we are willing to risk with uncertainties, this is shaped by our social and ethical political values. And what is central for trust is to find experts 
who would make the judgments you would if you had their expertise. This means finding experts who have similar social and ethical values that are at the moment of um, judgment of evidential sufficiency and asking the kinds of questions you would. So um, how much would you be willing to risk error in this particular case? And is the expert that you are going to trust making the same kind of judgment? This kind of consilience between the values of you and the expert is crucial for you to trust that the expert has your interests at heart, which we talked about at the beginning is central to trust. So the values, the social and ethical values, and the value of inquiry are going to matter. In conditions of disagreement among experts, we want to trust experts who value inquiry and who share your political, social, and ethical values, because then they will make judgments about evidential sufficiency as you would. In conditions of consensus among experts, which when we've got it, that's great. Um, we have to make sure that it's a consensus among trustworthy experts and trustworthy experts must value inquiry and have that scientific integrity. If there is a diversity of trustworthy experts reaching consensus, this means that the consensus has been reached, including experts who likely share your values and concerns. So then you don't have to worry about finding a particular expert who shares your values and concerns. It's likely that it has already been taken into account. And this is why consensus is a helpful indicator for trust, but um, isn't itself you know, the um, sole basis. So we should make tr uh, trust experts who would make judgments about the research and available evidence the way we would if we were experts with integrity. Um, this means that it's really important to assess experts' values. We have to be sure that we are trusting experts who value inquiry, who have scientific integrity, and it's useful to have experts share, show that they share our social and ethical values, because then when we have consensus, we can know that they are part of that consensus. And when there's dissensus, we know which experts we should trust. This means in cases of dissensus, trust in individual ex experts will not be universal. Some groups will trust some experts more than others. Okay, almost done. So how should we ground trust in scientific expertise? Um, first, I argued that trust in scientific evidence requires trust in scientific expertise. So we're really talking about trust in scientific expertise. There are three moves to make. First, we make sure that there's expertise present uh, in our you know, chosen either expert community or um, individual experts we want to trust. Then we have to assess the functioning of the expert community, including how well it responds to criticism that comes from both within and without. And finally, we need to assess the expert's values. Do they respect inquiry and do they um, share our other values? I think the virtues of this approach is it shows clearly that we can assess experts for trustworthiness without becoming experts. We don't have to have the same fluency of judgment. We don't have to know everything the expert knows. Um, the evidence that experts produce can thus be assessed for trustworthiness. In addition, I think this approach shows what both experts and non-experts should be expected to do. They, and it clarifies what is expected of them. So experts have to be able to explicate their judgment and to show respect for inquiry and be engaged in expert community and non-experts can track responsiveness to criticism, the proper concern for inquiry, and the recognition of important values. Um, there are, however, costs to this approach. I think we should have to give up on the expectation of universally trustworthy scientific expertise in all cases. That in cases where there is genuine dissensus, not everyone's gonna trust maybe our expert that we find trustworthy. Um, so we can still have expertise in ex, uh, we can still have universally trustworthy expertise in some cases. When you have readily accessible success about which the public cares, 
So, you know, are you worried about an expert um, who produces, a, you know, is the new gadget reliable? Well, you can just tell it works. So, you know, and the public cares about its success, readily accessible. Um, or if you have a strong, properly formed consensus among diverse experts, you can have universally trustworthy expertise. But we should neither demand nor wait for such markers. Expertise is not, um, you know, because it's really impractical and because very often we have to make decisions ahead of time. In addition, we have to give up the idea that expertise is generally value free or politically neutral. That's not what expertise is, even if it's super valuable for both epistemic reasons and for our own guidance and decision making. And because of its value, we still need trustworthy expertise and good governance. So I wanna thank you for listening to this and um, I look forward to our uh, Q&A session.